Hello, and welcome to another fully live news episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I'm a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have our cryptozoology expert, Michael, here as Alex continues to recover from some weird respiratory thing that me and everyone I know seems to have gotten last week. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, everybody else is feeling better, as am I. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different things to cover today. Michael, thank you for joining us. Of course. Uh, and just to set, set the record straight, he's stealing my shirt, not the other way around. <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Uh, this is actually the most popular shirt that we've uh, gotten requests to make mm -hmm. again, because it's, in my opinion, the funniest shirt that Veronis has ever made. Yeah. So uh, yeah, love this shirt. It's, Life's uh, a breach. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a classic. All right, so hello to everybody who is joining us in the chat. I can also see all your messages. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started with some of the news. Um, a lot of stuff has happened, of course, on Twitter. Um, that is just because, you know, all the That's new really weird. verification policies and stuff. And frankly, um, it really hasn't uh, been very fun for people who are trying to mm -hmm. participate in this. And this was evidenced by a number of different stories, uh, but... I, I'm I'm also just kind of throwing out there and asking, where is everyone going? You know, the InfoSec community has yeah. been very entrenched in Twitter for a long time. And, you know, I really enjoy Twitter just for the community and for the number of researchers that I stay in touch with there. So if you know exactly where people are going to, please um please shout it out in the comments because you know it's uh it's not a good week for people who mm -hmm. are uh on Twitter and are used to it being uh, kind of, you know, uh, the same as it has been for several years. So over on my screen, we do have one interesting case study that just came out, um, or at least like an observation of uh, a verified account, which of course was not the real Eli Lilly. Um, for some reason, Eli Lilly decided to go with uh, Lilypad um, as their like a uh, Twitter handle, which is cute, but not really great when somebody manages to grab Eli Lilly and co. Um, <laughs> like that, that's obviously like a pretty official mm -hmm. sounding handle and with the blue check mark. Um, it really did seem as though this little piece of uh, good news was actually official. And that caused the stock price of Eli Lilly to uh, plunge. Of course, you know, we're looking at 370 versus 340. This isn't exactly zero, yeah. but still this is a measurable drop in wealth. Um, driven by, in part, uh, misinformation on a platform that used to be very trusted for that. So just as one very small example of how misinformation has started to permeate Twitter and it's become more and more difficult to understand what is going on on this website, uh, yeah, this was one of the more interesting pieces of misinformation that's been spread uh, over the weekend. But there is, of course, more. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of an interesting weekend for, or kind of an interesting week for Twitter. And it's still going to be decided, I guess, where the InfoSec community <laughs> is going to end up. Although I've been seeing a lot of people uh, say Mastodon. So I went ahead and reactivated my Mastodon. And I'm in like a German language only like closed invitation <laughs> server that I joined at like the C3 conference. So um, yeah, I still need to find other people on there, uh, figure out exactly how mm -hmm. it works. But it seems like Twitter is uh, a little bit more unpredictable than usual. Uh, we do have a question in the comment. Can someone impersonate you? Me? Yeah. Um, I don't see what the point of that is. That's that's actually why, though, unlike Eli Lilly that's trying to be cute with Lilypad, I just took my full legal name. So, like, of course, like, people mm. can do, like, real me or whatever and and then, like, get that with a blue check mark, and then it would look as though, you know, that person was me. And that's why, like, mm. investing in Twitter as a platform right now is difficult to justify mm -hmm. for me because, like, you know, I put a lot of energy into like making my Twitter useful for people and like being a good point of contact for the hacker community and hearing back from people as I make content. But um, yeah, no, theoretically somebody could just like do, you know, like the real Cody Kinsey or something and then like verify it. And like I, in order to counter that would have to like pay to verify it too. And it just like doesn't really make sense. Cause like why, like why create the situation in the first place? So um, yeah, no, it, while I have gone with um, my full legal name as uh, my Twitter handle, um, a lot of people don't do that. So mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to grab their full name, for example, then that would be something that somebody could do and then verify. So you might wake up and find that some company has like verified mm -hmm. a Twitter handle under your name and is trying to turn around and sell it to you. That I, sounds fun. Yeah, I wonder how that would also work with multiple people with the same name, like Michael Raymond is a very common, like I know that there's at least like three cousins of mine that have that whoever, same name. <laughs> whoever pays Twitter first gets to be the official yeah. Michael Raymond. Again, even if that's a bot, and then like that could be used for all sorts of nasty things. Mm -hmm. So um, very like 
um, verifying information has always been a problem on Twitter. And that is by far the biggest problem that has come up this week is just like it becomes impossible to really know mm -hmm. who's an, an official source of information. And you can have all sorts of like big changes happen uh, in a very short period of time. So we'll see what happens. Cool. Uh, so over on my screen, we have a bit of spicy news for people that are uh, interested in open source repositories and GitHub and open source code. Um, so a programmer and lawyer, Matthew Butterwick, uh, is suing Microsoft, GitHub, and OpenAI. And this all has to do with the um, OpenAI Codex and GitHub Copilot. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with what this is, it's basically an AI-based programming aid um, to help people uh, using Visual Studio to do programming. Essentially, it was pro um, with AI, you have to use training data. And so the training data used in this case was open source repositories on GitHub. So this program, uh, you basically tell it what you want to do uh, in natural language, and then it'll give you some lines of code. Um, now, it turns out that those lines of code can frequently be straight ripped from uh, those open source repositories. Now, obviously, uh, or what the problem here is, is it's not properly attributing those open source repositories. So oftentimes with these licenses, um, the license requires that you um, give attribution to the author of the original code. Uh, but um, say I'm in Visual Studio using this open source tool, for all I know, the AI generated this code. I never know that it's actually ripping this code from an open source repository. So I don't even need know that I need to att attribute that code to someone else because I think the computer wrote it. Hmm. And then the computers, uh, the AI algorithms in no way telling me, oh, hey, you need to add this attribution because of this code. And then additionally, there's other problems where um, you know, a common problem we've seen on GitHub is secrets leaking, like API keys, uh, tokens, authentication, things like that. Uh, that, you know, even though we try our best, those invariably get on uh, GitHub occasionally. And it turns out that this um, GitHub Copilot is basically giving people uh, these API tokens that it's found on other repositories. So it, it is a major security risk, not just the, um, you know, legal uh, nebulous thing of, oh, well, it's not properly uh, attributing this. Um, so essentially, this guy is suing, what's the exact number here? Nine, I think I'm reading that right, $9 billion. Uh, the, the way the numbers work out here is there's a statutory damage uh, for a license violation of this type that is $250 per, or no, not $250, $2,500 per violation. Um, and that it's estimated that there's uh, 3.6 million violations already. And that's if it were stopping today. And each person only got given like one violation. Um, so quite an uh, alarming amount of uh, license violations. So, uh, and the people in the open source community, uh, the real fear it seems to be that over time that these sorts of AI algorithms are going to steal people away from these open source communities. And their fear is that over time, these repositories will become less maintained um, and, and the code used for them will not be great. And then you're going to get a sort of feedback loop where this AI algorithm is having uh, basically worse and worse code to base its uh, recommend code recommendations off of. And so uh, people just won't know about these communities and will get worse and worse code. Yeah, from a Microsoft perspective, it seems like if you wanted to be sneaky, then just mangling the, the code so it's not an exact copy mm -hmm. and it like preserves the underlying logic, but like otherwise like changes the actual code. Like there's a lot of ways that like a sneaky AI could disguise business logic of like uh, an, an open source mm -hmm. project that works really well and then make it look like, you know, you, you're doing the same thing, but in a different way. It's much harder to prove that that's mm -hmm. the same code. Uh, and it seems like for Microsoft anyway, they can like relatively easily just stop infringing on like code directly and mm -hmm. like make it instead that it's just changing the actual code, but preserving the idea behind the code, which is again, much harder to prosecute or like actually yeah. prove. 
So um, while it seems like they're they're stealing from open source projects to create a commercial, it, like, how do you steal from an open source project? Well, you turn around and use that to create mm -hmm. a commercial product uh, that doesn't provide like a lot of value without uh, that open source stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that's like what the argument is. But you know, like if you can do that without making it super obvious what you're doing, then it becomes pretty difficult for those open source projects to really do much about it because it's not clear how that code is being written anymore. Whereas mm -hmm. right now it just seems like it's being like assembled and then like pasted. Right. Yeah. And um, like you were alluding to, these are sometimes like verbatim copy and paste from these repositories. And like you said, it could get a little messier and nebulous because you would still have the underlying concerns about, um, detracting from these open source communities, uh, even if you're just stealing the functions and not necessarily, you know, the exact variables and the API tokens and everything. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's just one of those messy things. And I didn't love the way uh, Microsoft responded with like a non-answer to this. Um, basically, uh, Microsoft response was, we've been committed to innovating responsibly with Copilot from the start and will continue to evolve the product to best serve developers ac across the globe. Like the, Yeah, we know the, that's why you made it. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, obviously, like you already said that. Yeah, that's exactly. Funny. So they just like reiterated their company line and they're like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's like a mission. And, and it, it like, I, I really get annoyed sometimes when companies like don't even address that your concerns might be valid and be like, oh, I understand where you're coming from. This is why we think that it it, it doesn't hurt the licenses in this way. Uh, well, you know, um, but yeah, it, they, they didn't seem to accept uh, any kind of arguments, but alas. All right, so over on my screen, we have uh, a actually really cool piece of news about somebody on our team. So Angela Tosobi is one of the newest developers on our USB Nugget and Wi-Fi Nugget project. Um, so at Hackout, we have a number of people that are doing like uh, programming and development. And Angelina has been present at our workshops and uh, generally been a really big contributor over the last couple months. So Angelina went ahead and made this Wicon kit that uses the ESP8266. It looks like on in this case on a Node MCU um, kind of setup to combine a bunch of really interesting Wi-Fi hacking concepts. So um, she used some cool things that both myself, Alex Lin, and um, Spacehoon have put together for doing Wi-Fi uh, like attack detection and also some basic Wi-Fi attacks, as well as a FTP server that acts as a honeypot. So if anybody attempts to connect to it, then it will call out and send you an email alert using a Canary token. So all this stuff was kind of baked into one interesting little device. And uh, there's even a video that covers how, how it works. So if you're interested in some cool hardware stuff, then of course the ESP8266 is a great tool uh, to do a lot of this stuff on. And I'm not sure if this would work on a Wi-Fi nugget, but I kind of think it it would, honestly, because there's nothing really here that it wouldn't have. So that's that's really awesome. So uh, Angelina goes on to explain like how this all works. There's an explanation of the honeypot, how to put this together on a little piece of perf board. And uh, yeah, so this is a really cool project that was well documented, and it was really great to see somebody on our team actually uh, being in the news this week. Mm -hmm. So uh, shout out to Angelina. And uh, if you want to see a cool project using very low cost uh, components, then you can check that out. Yeah. Um, OK, over, sorry, multitasking here. <laughs> uh, running the stream and being on the stream is always a fun challenge. Um, so we have an Instagram influencer known as Hush Puppy which, okay, what a heck of a name. Um, but Hush Puppy has been sentenced to 11 years in prison for basically being one of the uh, largest uh, money launderers in the world. Um, and essentially what this guy was doing is social engineering people. Um, and for instance, he social engineered one person uh, into giving him, what was it, uh, $600,000 um, I'm trying to find the exact number here, but he social engineered a guy into giving him $600,000 to perform a um, bank loan assessment. Um, so basically uh, assessing that the guy was, um, you know, able to receive this imaginary loan. Uh, he, he also uh, laundered $14.7 million for North Korean hackers that they stole from Maltese uh, bank. Uh, then he laundered millions of pounds stolen from 
uh, professional uh, soccer club what? in the UK uh, using Mexican bank accounts. And then, so this whole time too, why I say social engineering is he was using all the proceeds from this to like increase his reputation on Instagram as like some like big bridges influencer, you know, uh, living this lavish lifestyle of luxury and then was able to use that cultivated persona uh, to further his social engineering. Um, so it's like just a crazy wild story. I could almost see like a movie being made out of this <laughs> at some point. Um, you know, what was Catch Me If You Can? It reminds me of that almost, but I don't know that he's as good as that guy was. <laughs> um, and then we have another note here. Um, basically about enhancing your privacy with a second phone number. Uh, so this is referred to as a burner phone. Now, we often think of burner phones as being a physical phone, but that isn't always the case. There are things such as uh, virtual burner phones. But don't those have the same like IMEI so they can be tracked through that? Right. So so the... We covered that in that like article about like Russian, mm -hmm. um, like people getting like a second well, SIM card and swapping I'm not a SIM and then like still getting caught. I'm not 100% sure that's true. Uh, but the way... Uh, this is working is basically there's a server somewhere and they're giving you these virtual numbers. And, and um, mm -hmm. I don't think this is going to be targeted for people that are trying to avoid government level um, tracking. This is more targeted for people who are concerned with like just general privacy as in like, I'm a business owner. I, I want to receive calls on my personal phone, but I don't want to give my personal phone number. Okay. That's Google voice. Right. right. So it's not Google yeah, voice. Yeah. So it's basically, well, I think Google voice would be considered a, a virtual burner phone. Um, but yeah, so this article is just highlighting uh, one of the newer companies in this space. Um, I think it's called Hushed. Yeah. Hushed. Um, Burner is another one. Uh, Hush seems targeted towards iOS devices. Uh, Burner is something I personally had experience with uh, on Android. I think they also work on uh, iOS. But it's just a nice little reminder that these uh, virtual Michael, burners Michael, exist. This seems like an ad. Yeah, yeah. This, this, <laughs> this article this... seems like an ad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, all right, let's, let's, switch to, let's switch over to my screen. So... Um, there are a number of different Hack5 products that are out there that people know about, like the mm -hmm. USB rubber ducky. But I'd say the, the next best known is the Wi-Fi pineapple. Um, and why is that, Michael? Uh, I'm sorry, I was reading something else. Uh, the Wi-Fi pineapple is a Wi-Fi attack suite that makes mm -hmm. it really easy for people to get started with all sorts of interesting attacks against Wi-Fi networks. And the primary one is like rogue access points, like mm -hmm. things that let you... Um, let you just attack any nearby wireless device and start doing things like trying to find wireless uh, networks it's connected to before that maybe you could fake and try to like get it to connect to you. So uh, Microsoft Defender has been updated now to have functionality on basically every major operating system, including iOS devices and Android devices <clears throat> that are running Microsoft mm -hmm. Defender for endpoint uh, enterprise. By the way, James, I am feeling a bit better. So thank you very much for noticing. Um, but yeah, so what this means is that if you are a hacker and you have something like a Hack5 Wi-Fi Pineapple, see, it's cool to be mentioned in the news. Hack5 mm -hmm. gets mentioned all the time. Um, then this will actually allow you to detect like somebody operating a Wi-Fi Pineapple and trying to attack you um, automatically. So if you don't have protection built in and your organization decides to implement this, then this extends to virtually all different endpoints that are enrolled in this. And it can be silently rolled out to them provided they are enrolled in your like corporate enterprise policy. So for any corporation that's like worried about these sorts of attacks, endpoint attacks, where somebody is specifically setting up like a rogue access point and going after employees or after a sensitive area, then this will provide a new level of security and be able to detect against suspicious Wi-Fi behavior and also rogue certificates. So that means if uh, somebody was able to trick your device into joining a rogue access point, this would be able to detect like a malicious certificate or something like that and be able to pop up an alert and tell you to go to another ne Wi-Fi network or something like that. So this is great because fre frequently endpoints are not very well managed and it's mm -hmm. relatively easy to just hook one with a rogue access point or something like that and be able to get information as data travels through you and maybe manipulate uh, DNS endpoints and pop up a phishing page and do some other interesting stuff. 
um, it really is a lot easier to attack a device if you control its data. And by tricking it into joining a Wi-Fi network, you have a pretty easy way of getting a device to start associating with a malicious uh, tool like the Pineapple. So having this sort of like pineapple detector built into a variety of different operating systems is a really big advantage for organizations because frankly, it makes them harder to target. And it means you really have to start customizing your attack. And you can't just be like a low skilled operator running the default settings on the Wi-Fi pineapple and expect it to just work anymore. Cool. Uh, OK, over on my screen here, we have, OK. The great mystery solved. Um, so some of y'all may remember the uh, dark old days of the Silk Road Marketplace. And uh, ever since those days, there's been a great mystery floating around uh, because basically there was a heist uh, and someone was able to steal approximately 50,000 Bitcoins from uh, the Silk Road back in the day. Um, just for a little perspective, this uh, was valued at $3.3 billion uh, in 2021 when they finally captured the man responsible, uh, James Zoll. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the last name. But um, yeah, essentially, it was seems what is like a very easily uh, exploitable flaw, at least based on the details uh, exposed in, here, is um, there was escrow set up on the marketplace um, that, to make sure the transactions went through and such. Um, so there was a delay when withdrawing from your own escrow account. Uh, so essentially, James was able, I'm assuming, to write some simple code that took advantage of that delay. Uh, I'm assuming it was really short, as in you know, milliseconds, but it doesn't go into that detail in the article. But uh, by taking advantage of that uh, escrow, he could withdraw his escrow uh, funds multiple times. So you could easily triple, or in this case, you know, more than quadruple your, your money, uh, getting away with, I think in total, there was some 51,000 Bitcoins uh, eventually seized. So that great mystery has finally been solved. That's so funny because like <laughs> when you're when you're attacking something like a, a dark net marketplace mm -hmm. and like people are trying to pay for their criminal transactions and like you steal their bitcoins like what are they going to do call right. the police like that's not going to well, happen. Yeah, and in this case the police did really go after it. And, eventually, and, eventually right. like but they had to take down the marketplace first. So like, mm -hmm. you know, he had a good head start before they were involved because mm -hmm. nobody's going to call 911 well, if like you're Bitcoins have been plundered in an already illegal transaction. Yeah, well, and that's part of the interesting aspect of this mystery too, is because uh, he still had the 50,000 Bitcoin a decade later. So <laughs> it's like, clearly you did not liquidize those assets. And I think that- Liquidate, yeah. You liquidate um, the, those assets. And I think that highlights part of the problem that criminals have when using Bitcoin and so certain other uh, cryptocurrencies is- uh, you may have all this perceived wealth, but if you can't actually uh, transfer that into uh, real world value, uh, have you really gotten away with anything? Should have gotten into NFTs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So that's all I got for a second. All right. So over on my screen, have you been offered a job uh, that's so easy that all you do is just receive packages and inspect them and reship them? Well, you have probably been operating as a money mule. <laughs> um, and this is something that the government is now cracking down on. The FBI and the Postal Service have been looking into these scams and they have frankly been used to get around like sanctions and other sorts of things that would prevent certain types of goods from being shipped or they might even just be another layer of credit card fraud. So having a bunch of stuff shipped to you using a stolen credit card and then having you reship it to the person who stole the credit card. So obviously some of these transactions are going to be more risky than others, but people who sign up for this sort of job have no real way of knowing exactly what is going on. Um, that's why if it seems too good to be true, it probably is when it comes to doing these sort of inspector style jobs or forwarder style jobs. Uh, if in particular, if you have been a part of any one of these 18 domains, Ameridash, Control Scorpio, Cost Account, Dash Amari, Dashboard Zim, Dash E-Green, Dash Orient, Dash Satari, 
SPT, eGreen Dash, Main SGL, Navos Account, Orient Dash, Sabori Dash, Scorpio Control. <laughs> wow. Okay. ScorpioControl.com. That's intense. SPT Dash or Zim Dash.com. Um, these are all money mule organizations that apparently were primarily run by Russia. So because, uh, you know, we're not really talking to them right now, uh, a lot of these people have not been caught. Only the URLs and the money mules have been actually taken down. So it's highly likely that they are going to continue their operations using newly registered domains because, frankly, all that was really able to be targeted here was the people um, kind of either handling the money or handling the goods that were being brought in. So if you are being offered a job and you are being asked to either pay out of your own account in order to purchase goods or you are being asked to receive goods mm -hmm. and then ship it to somebody else out of your home location or your work, you are probably a money mule. And aside <laughs> from uh, being used to get around mm -hmm. sanctions and just steal money, it's also possible that you might be laundering money for something like a cartel. So you probably shouldn't take that job because again, if it seems too good to be true, it very well could be. Um, speaking of that too good to be true feeling, uh, if you are going to try to sell nuclear <laughs> secrets okay. um, and like you can find a buyer like that, you might be talking to the FBI. So a nuclear engineer and his wife were sentenced to 19 years uh, and more than 20 years in prison uh, for attempting to sell warship design secrets uh, to somebody they thought was a foreign power. But instead, it was actually, again, just the FBI. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward story here. They attempted to sell these secrets, but knew enough about how much of a big deal that was to come up with elaborate, an elaborate series of dead drops and other security measures to try to make sure that they knew who they were talking to. Unfortunately, none of these, again, like relatively uh, elaborate, like encrypted mm -hmm. emails and uh, peanut butter sandwiches and chewing gum packages, say, like signals, were enough to really verify whether or not they were talking to anybody other than the original undercover FBI agent that proposed this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So um, taking like all this elaborate security really only convinced people who were watching this case that they were very, very serious about selling these secrets. And they were following the playbook from like, I guess like spy novels that they'd seen before. So um, ultimately their security only granted them a very long prison sentence because uh, yeah, um, making a dead, dead drop of an SD card uh, in Eastern Virginia by concealing the card in a chewing gum package <laughs> really only convinced everyone that they were sneaky people that were dedicated to trying to leak this data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So over on my screen, as we all know, the Lenovo is a very beloved computer brand in our community, including the ThinkBook, IdeaPad, and Yoga Laptop. However, if you're using these models and you're using the UEFI Secure Boot, I have very bad news for you. It's probably not working the way uh, you intend for it to do because Lenovo had a little bit of an oopsies. You see, they had firmware that they were using for developmental purposes that allowed you to basically configure the Secure Boot uh, while within the OS. Um, this was intended purely for developmental purposes. However, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's miscommunication or just a tight timeline, this firmware got applied to production uh, laptops and sent out. Um, and so it wasn't until quite a while later that uh, several security researchers discovered this. Uh, so basically, if you have this secure boot, um, there's a pretty trivial way to disable that secure boot. Uh, and for maybe some of you that aren't familiar with like what secure boot is, uh, basically the BIOS on your motherboard, uh, it ensures that uh, untrusted code is not run uh, on that level and uh, you know helps ensure that you don't get malicious code that installs itself on your uh, firmware. Uh, so that way, you know, even if you installed a new OS, it would still be infected. Uh, so that helps protect against those things, but these computers aren't protected because of uh, this little oopsie Lenovo made. Uh, fortunately, those things are fixed now, um, and you can go to Lenovo's website, and they have a way for you to check and see if it uh, your machine is affected, and then uh, you can update your firmware. Uh, in further news, we've seen that hacktivists really like DDoSing 
um, various organizations that they just don't like for whatever reason. Um, but the FBI has done a bit of a study and um, basically they're saying that these uh, DDoS attacks or uh, distributed denial of service attacks aimed at websites frequently don't have any to negligible impact, uh, essentially because uh, these targets often uh, target the uh, basically like consumer facing public website and not the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so an example of these sorts of attacks and why they're not really uh, working the way these hacktivists want them to is, for instance, the Atlanta airport. Uh, their website got targeted by one of these DDoS attacks, um, but that wasn't on the same servers or in, in no way connected uh, to actual flight operations at the airport. So absolutely zero flights were delayed because of this DDoS attack. Now you could argue that, okay, well, maybe some people weren't able to book their flights uh, and it did have some impact in those regards. Um, but we've seen time and time again that these DDoS impacts uh, attacks don't have the level of impact that you might imagine that they would. Well, I mean, if you're a little, sorry, but if you're like a hacktivist group and you are trying to make a statement without right. going to prison, like you're not going to try to like ground the entire United States. You're going right. to try to like take down the marketing website, you know, for mm -hmm. the, for the company that's public facing and embarrass them. for a couple Right. Of days. And, and, and that is something that the FBI notes is that um, these are very uh, visual uh, things um, and that's what they were basically saying is it's a, while it's a visual and a scary thing and it gets people riled up, um, it doesn't actually have like critical business ramifications. Right. Cause nobody wants like Congress to unanimously <laughs> pa like pass a bill specifically to like track down your organization or something because you delayed like a Senator's flight, yeah. like, oh, you know, yeah. like, yeah, exactly. like, yeah, like taking down their marketing website versus taking down their production, like infrastructure, like mm -hmm. is a very different crime. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's actually a question I had reading this is I was like, well, is it because these hacktivists don't know what to target? And so they're just targeting the public facing websites or are they intentionally choosing these as opposed to uh, the back end servers? Yeah, I would say like embarrassing a, a, a company is like a is a big difference between like um, bringing them to their knees, you know, <laughs> like that, like one right. of them is attack against like, like some would argue like critical, like national infrastructure. And the mm -hmm. second one is like, you know, like unfortunate. Yeah. So, well, yeah. It, it, that, uh, that is another thought I had with the airport one in particular is we've seen uh, just some idiot with a drone near an airport shut down airports for longer and it caused much more chaos uh, than these much more sophisticated DDoS attacks on the website. Mm. So, you know, it really doesn't take much to, to cause havoc in, this, in those industries. So in more cybercrime news, a one of the two largest national grocery stores in uh, Canada have been hit with the Black Vasta ransomware. So this is something that has been developing and there have been multiple statements out saying, oh, you know, it's a uh, the stores are open to customers, but some some internal services are down. Um, it really doesn't sound that bad, right? Well, these are pictures of the actual terminals. Wow. Um, they are locked out and they have um, the same ransom that this exact strain of ransomware has used before. So it's reasonable to assume that the internal networks are now locked and there is a ransom um, that is being demanded in order to be able to get access to it. Now, um, this is also something that is a bit difficult to know exactly who's in charge here because sometimes these groups will use affiliates that don't really have anything to do with the original authors, but it is suspected that the Conti ransomware group might have some ties to this based on the similarities to the way that it has been deployed and the similarities in the infrastructure. Uh, there was also a development in a ransomware operator for Lockbit finally being targeted and taken down in Canada. So this was apparently someone that was at the top of Interpol's list of people they were trying to find because this ransomware affiliate was using the software to make a lot of money. Uh, so it looks like this was a 33-year-old Russian national who had dual citizenship in uh, Canada, and they were able to seize 400,000 uh, euros, sorry, worth of <laughs> cryptocurrency, uh, 32 hard drives, and eight computers. Oh, and two firearms, too. Uh, so this is kind of a good example of how the people behind the ransomware very rarely get caught. It's the ransomware operators mm -hmm. who are out there actually using it to target and attack people that end up getting wrapped up. But also they tend to make a lot of money, but at a substantial risk. They are the ones who generally will get caught before the people who are actually behind the software. So this is 
generally part of a trend we've seen of the ransomware operators getting caught while the people behind the actual ransomware kind of hide themselves behind people that are paying to use their service. Hmm. Okay, so over here we have this week's reminder of don't install sketchy Chrome extensions. Hmm. Um, so in this case, uh, there's a Chrome browser extension um, that's creating a botnet called Cloud9 uh, that's been discovered in the wild. Um, now, unlike some of the ones we've talked about in previous weeks, this isn't hosted on the Chrome extension store. Instead, when you go to a malicious websites, these websites will prompt you to download, a, I think it's an Adobe Flash Player update. And when you do that, basically it takes you through installing uh, this Flash Player uh, extension. But really, it's just like a real nasty uh, piece of malware um, that it does everything from uh, collecting information on your system, uh, potentially for further exploitation, uh, starts like uh, mining cryptocurrency with additional resources. Uh, so if you ever wonder why your Chrome is taking up uh, a lot of your CPU power all of a sudden, that might be why. Um, as well as uh, what I alluded to earlier and using uh, these Chrome extensions to perform DDoS attacks. Now these DDoS attacks are very uh, nefarious because since it's using your Chrome browser, uh, these attacks look very legitimate. Uh, to the um, targeted server. So it's much harder to filter out uh, this uh, traffic as opposed to, you know, traffic that might be received from a hacked like uh, TV box or something like that. Um, so definitely be careful about what Chrome extensions you install. If a website ever prompts you to install a Chrome extension, I would immediately start from uh, a place of extreme distrust. Uh, and basically never do it. Um, and of course, you know, Google provides some very helpful advice here uh, in, you know, basically what I just said. Don't don't install sketchy up uh, extensions. But one thing that is actually valid here that I think most of us know about, but if your friends and family don't know about, uh, the Google Chrome enhanced protection, uh, if you don't have that enabled, uh, enable that. And that, um, it makes it a little louder when you go to these sketchy websites about telling you, hey, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and it also will inspect various downloads and anything uh, you download through Chrome uh, and try to look for uh, malicious programs. Obviously, that's not going to be perfect, but it's better than nothing. Over to you. All right. So... There's one piece of well, there's one piece of instruction that a lot of people get in order to avoid being phished, which mm -hmm. is if you're not sure about a link that's being sent to you, use a reputable search engine to you know look up the official website or whatever, and then go there. Um, that usually works, right? Like if you want to go to like your bank's website, you can just type in your bank's name and find it using a search engine. However, um, this doesn't always work, and that is because of uh, SEO poisoning attacks. Mm -hmm. So if you have a botnet, what exactly can you do with it? Well, it depends on what that botnet is. If you have a bunch of like vulnerable, uh, let's say like WordPress plugins, then one thing you can do is use those WordPress websites to basically link to malicious domains and give them very, very high search authority. Meaning that when somebody searches for certain terms, they're extremely likely to turn up one of these malicious websites uh, with very high confidence at the top of the search index. Now, right now, it looks as though these are not being used for anything active. And in the future, they're probably going to be primed for uh, doing some sort of like uh, dropping of malicious files or redirecting people to something that will infect them with some sort of malicious code. But what's sketchy here is because we use search engines to find things reliably, uh, making sure that a lot of people discover a malicious website is something mm -hmm. that these sort of botnets are really, really good at. Now, it looks like this particular attack is being run through um, WordPress websites, and that is the main attack vector. If you have a WordPress website that doesn't have updated extensions or plugins, this is going to be pretty much the main problem here, is old extensions or old plugins that make a WordPress website vulnerable to being taken over by one of these botnets and then used to amplify malicious websites. Now, there's a really long list of malicious URLs here, but this is just a short version of the list n.photolovegirl.com like some of these are you know kind of interesting but a lot of these look like they are 
fake like question and answer sites. And um, again, they're being primed to eventually deliver malicious programs or be able to redirect people to other cybercrime resources. So um, yeah, um, again, make sure you're updating your WordPress websites, especially if they have extensions installed, because these have come up over and over as a way people are able to manipulate or over mm -hmm. uh, just completely take over a WordPress website that has a vulnerable extension installed. Hmm. Okay. I think we're almost out of time, but one last piece I have here is, uh, so VMware has released a security update. Uh, so this is in regards to Workspace ONE Assist. Uh, essentially, uh, backing up here, uh, VMware is software to virtualize machines. Um, you know, frequently this can be used uh, to sand, uh, make a sandbox environment to analyze malware and other stuff. Uh, but in this case, Workplace One Assist is basically a IT support program to help people that are having to use VMware for their the work computer in some regard. Um, and so basically it'll share the screen and give the IT person remote control so that it can help uh, a person through the issue. However, uh, Previously, uh, there have been authentication bypasses and those, those have been fixed. And again, uh, even more recently today, uh, uh, additional authentication bypasses have been found uh, for this uh, Workplace One Assist. So it essentially means that a hacker who has network access to whatever uh, network this is running on uh, can completely bypass all the authentication and just pop uh, up uh, what's essentially a remote access tool on uh, any virtualized machine that they have running in VMware. Uh, so very nasty things. Uh, and I think uh, it's, again, one of those demonstrations of when you're doing these things, these, these tools are uh, exactly what a hacker wants. So when you do uh, install some of these uh, convenience and ease of life uh, utility tools, you have to be very careful to make sure that they're really locked down uh, and the fact that this has had two separate uh, authentication bypass issues uh, is slightly concerning that there might be even more found in the future. But at least for the time being, uh, for the CVEs listed here, all of those have been patched. So if you are using VMware and uh, Workspace ONE Assist, make sure you've updated that to the most recent version. All right, uh, somebody in the chat, uh, Brandon in the chat asked, um, have, has anyone here been phished? Yeah, when I was working at a startup one time, mm -hmm. we had our email password, or sorry, not email, our uh, Wi-Fi password phished by having someone deauthenticate our network, create a clone of our network but that was open, and then pretend that our network was going through an update and needed the password in order to continue. Um, yeah, so yeah, no, it happens. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so my last news piece of the week is a little bit technical and there's kind of some moving pieces of this. So um, Windows went ahead and fixed actually a number of um, zero day bugs that were exploited to push malicious programs. And now if you manage to trick somebody on Windows into downloading something off the internet, then you know they might have downloaded your malicious program, but it's locked down because of something called Mark of the Web. Michael, you remember what the Mark of the Web is? Uh, yeah, so essentially, basically it's just this um, tag applied to files that are downloaded from a browser or somewhere like that. Uh, and essentially Windows, basically when it sees that tag, it treats uh, the file as if it's very untrustworthy. Right, exactly. So yeah, it says almost exactly verbatim what it says here. It's, uh, it treats um, files originally from the internet, so they're tagged as suspicious by the operating system and installed application. So it gives them a warning, like, hey, mm -hmm. this might be something that the user doesn't intend to run. So um, being able to implement this mark of the web has been a really good thing for security because it gives mm -hmm. like a pop-up or something that like alerts people to exactly like where this was downloaded from. You can see the URL that it came from, like all that stuff. That's cool. So uh, people who are trying to install a malicious program then want to get around this as much as possible. So what they would end up doing is trying to get around this pop-up by doing something like having an ISO file. Now, ISO files are like a like a disk image file. And by default, Windows will mount this as like a DVD drive and then allow you to open files on it. And for whatever reason, it would not propagate this mark of the web to files that were within this ISO. So this became a very, very obvious uh, kind of way of getting someone to open a file that should be marked as suspicious, but instead was just going to run automatically. So this was one of the big things that was fixed. Um, that is 
also one of just the default ways that these malicious actors started uh, attempting to get people to open this stuff and get around Mark of the Web. Uh, so there's also some other things such as Windows Link shortcuts um, that we're able to get around this. And I believe Will Dorman, um, who used to give me some very good advice when I was just learning about hacking. So shout out to him. Uh, he's in the news a lot, uh, which mm -hmm. is very cool. Um, found some other Mark of the Web propagation issues that made it so it was possible to get around this sort of thing. Um, one of them was just running things from a zip without uh, without actually unzipping it managed to get around this. Um, for more details, uh, less simplified details, you can check out mm -hmm. Will Dorman's post on this. But uh, this is a little example of him running something, um, which is calc.zip, that should not be uh, allowed to run. And it looks like it's yeah. crashed smart screen. Nice. Um, <laughs> that seems like a lot of steps, but also very spooky. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's definitely some ways that are uh, designed to get around this mark of the web. And mm -hmm. some of them have been assigned the CVE 2022-41049 if you want to look it up more about the technical details. But again, this is kind of trying to get rid of some of those really easy ways that threat actors have of getting around having Mark of the Web applied to a malicious file you're trying to deliver to a victim's computer. Mm -hmm. Because typically, um, they won't be able to do very much with a file that's been marked with a Mark of the Web because it won't open the same and it will require all sorts of like clicks and con confirmations and like confirming mm -hmm. suspicious looking things in, in order to actually execute. Whereas getting around that means it'll just run. So, all right, so that's all we have time for today. Thank you to everybody in the chat. And uh, make sure to check out our next Q&A live stream mm -hmm. on Wednesday, where hopefully Alex will be back and he's feeling better. And uh, yeah, big shout out to Verona's per always for letting us do this weekly news stream. And we'll see you next time. Bye.